Hey, it's Pastor Noah, and here we are. It's episode 10. We have made it now through nine full episodes, and here is the 10th and the last of our Engage video series. And, and today we, we round out the end of the creed and focus on the last couple of, of phrases, of statements that root us um, as a people of God. When we say, what do we believe? What does it mean to be a Christian? Um, this Apostles' Creed outlines the basics, and, and these are the last two. This is the end of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So let's dive in and unpack what these phrases mean. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now we've already spent a little bit of time on the resurrection in this series because the creed talks about it specifically related to Jesus. What it means that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, if you need a little refresher, you can go back to uh, episode six in this Engage series. But this is a little more specific about what the impact of the resurrection is on us as Christians because when we talk about the resurrection, we're not just talking about Jesus Christ. Because being a Christian means actually being united to Jesus Christ. And so everything that happens to Jesus, everything that connects with Jesus, everything that Jesus is, Jesus' is very life, that gets transferred to all those who are connected to Jesus. So when we talk about the resurrection of the body, resurrection of Jesus, that automatically connects to each one of us. So let's read what the Heidelberg says about the resurrection of the body. It's uh, number 57. Heidelberg says this. The question is, how does the resurrection of the body comfort you? The answer, not only will my soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but also my very flesh will be raised by the power of Christ, reunited with my soul, and made like Christ's glorious body. So you may remember from the last time we talked about resurrection that when we talk about resurrection, we're not just talking about life after death. We're talking about life after life after death. This sort of generic life after death, meaning that when you die, your soul floats off to go someplace, that's not really the end of the story. Uh, we see um, in scripture, again, when Jesus is talking to the, the repentant thief on the cross uh, in Luke 23, that um, we see that Jesus makes this promise. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. That's that first stage life after death. But the Christian hope is in resurrection. It's on the other side of life after death, this life after, life after death, which as Heidelberg says, also, not only is that, that first life after death something that we can be secure in to know that my soul will be immediately taken to Christ its head, but also after that, the implication is after that, my very flesh will be raised by the power of Christ and reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time that I really grasped this part of what it meant to be a Christian, to hope in resurrection, it honestly blew my mind. Because to be honest, most of my images of heaven uh, when I was a kid growing up in church were not really that fun sounding. Like I had this image of you know floating on the clouds and playing golden harps in this eternal worship service something. Um, it just wasn't that compelling. But this image, this picture, this picture of actually joining Christ, the way that Christ was resurrected with a body, a body that could eat and hug and, and laugh and be with his be with his disciples this sort of life an actual renewal 
uh, coming back to your body and all of the goodness of the body without any of the badness of the pain of the body, that's amazing. And that is what is happening here when we confess our hope that we believe in the resurrection of the body. We are saying that we believe that this world is not just made to be burned up and ground up. It, it doesn't mean that something is bad just because it has physicality. It's actually the opposite of that. It's saying that in Jesus Christ, God is going to redeem and make perfect everything that is physical. Everything that can be broken in this world is going to be fixed and made right and made whole and healed in Christ, even our own bodies. The Heidelberg, as you may have noticed, has all of these, these scriptural references that point you back to scripture to say, kind of like the grounding of, why do we say this? Well, this is how. It's from these scriptures that, we, uh, that we're focusing on, that we, that we are saying these things with confidence. And you'll see one of those in Heidelberg 57 is from Philippians uh, 3.21. And this is what it says. He will transform the body of our humiliation so that it might be conformed to the body of his glory. Paul is saying that Jesus is the one. It's by Jesus' power, again, that these bodies, these bodies that we have are going to be transformed into the body like the one that Jesus had at his resurrection. But there's this other thing that's tied so closely to our hope of the resurrection, and it's the next thing in the creed, the life everlasting. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting are so tied to each other. And there's two reasons for it. The first is the fact that these bodies that we have, these bodies will die. As you might have studied in, uh, in, in biology, all living things die. There's a life cycle and there's nothing in this world that's alive that doesn't end up stop being alive. But what scripture tells us is that the body that Christ was raised to will not die. It's imperishable. It is immortal. It can't die. And that is the kind of body that you and I are going to be raised with, transformed into. But again, here is something that is so much deeper and richer and more full than what I had in mind, at least when I was a kid growing up in church. See, my understanding was that life everlasting was just kind of like an endless sequence of days. This wasn't really all that compelling to me. It was something like Groundhog Day where just every day you woke up and it was just the same thing over and over and over again, just forever. I knew I was supposed to want that, but I wasn't quite sure if I did. And then I began to realize in my study and in, in being taught that there was so much more to it than just this endless succession of days. Because the life that is promised here, the life everlasting, is one that is infinite not only in quantity, but also in quality. Even in Philippians 3, if we back up a couple of verses, we'll see that there's more going on here. Listen to what Paul says. Paul's writing about this. There's this contrast that Paul is setting up. He says, For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've told you often of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, meaning like their appetites, their desires. And the glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Again, here, here, earthly things is not act, doesn't mean the physical things, the, the trees, the rocks, the, the friends, the food of this world. But Paul says, when Paul says this, this earthly things, he, he means the first creation, the old order, the order of sin and death, the things that have been conquered and defeated in Christ. That's what Paul means by the earthly things. But our citizenship, Paul says, goes on, is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation so that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. 
So right here we see this really key uh, distinction, this, this separation where Paul is saying there's, there is this first age, the age of sin and death, that Christ came to meet, to heal, to destroy, to put aside. Paul says there are some people that are totally invested in that. It's what they love. He says with tears, this is true. And then he says, but our hope is in heaven. There is a world that's coming. And this age that is to come was made, um, the Greek word for this, the age to come is ionios. Now, ionios is this is the Greek word for, for age. Think like like bronze age or stone age or ice age, like a, a given, like a, a specific like period of time uh, that has certain characteristics. Paul is saying that there is this this heavenly age, this age to come, is where, that's where our hope is. The one where Christ is on the throne. The one where Jesus is Lord. The one where there is justice and peace that reign everywhere. The way that the, in, um, at the end of Revelation, John says, uh, when Christ is on the throne and, and, the, and the creation is, the, the new creation is brought into its fullness and its perfection, uh, that there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more mourning, no more crying. This is the age that is coming in Jesus Christ. And what's fascinating is that if you listen to this older the, the, this verse that you will that you may know by heart, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. Eternal life. That word eternal is the Greek word ionios. This life to come, this eternal life, this life of the age as John is saying, the, this life of the age to come, that is the life that is, that is coming. Listen to what, um, to what Heidelberg says about the life everlasting in Heidelberg 58. How does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Answer. Even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life, I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined, a blessedness in which to praise God forever. So the life everlasting um, that the creed talks about um, is this same word, life everlasting, as the everlasting in John 3, 16, um, uh, eternal everlasting, agely life, the age to come. It's all the same thing. It is a, it is a infiniteness that's not only infinite in quantity, but it's infinite in quality. The beginning of this joy that we have right now as Christians, this is something that this, this life, this, the life of the spirit, the life of Jesus, the age to come is something that is present to us right now. We catch glimpses of it. It's not all day, every day. We do see it. It comes. It comes in fits and starts. And this is something that will be made full, made full, made full. And you will see it. You will see it. I think it's notable here that in the Heidelberg 58, this is a blessedness in which to praise God forever. I think it's worth noting here that, um, that this praising God forever is what heaven is what the age to come when heaven meets earth is what it will be like. It will be praising God forever. But I want you to think about that in a really full way. It's not going to be just like one of our Sunday morning services stretched out forever. I want you to think about the Psalms. The Psalms are the church's prayer book and a full third of them are lament Psalms. Psalms where the the writer of the psalm, the psalmist says, God, things are awful right now. Things are really bad. Where are you, God? This isn't the way things are supposed to be. So when we read this in the Heidelberg, I want you to think about what would it be like to live in a world where you didn't have to pray that ever, where you never had to pray, God, why is it like this? 
God, come and change this. God, bring peace and justice and wholeness to this world. Imagine a world where it's never lament. It's always praise. That's the world that's coming. So this is the end of the creed. These two things bound together, hope in the resurrection of the body, which is tied to this life everlasting. These bodies that are resurrected to a life everlasting. Bodies made ready in all the ways for a life infinite, not only in, in scope um, of days, but scope of depth. The world that Jesus is opening up is literally a new creation. It's the beginning of this whole beautiful reality that is so deep and so wide that it will take an eternity to get to the end and to get to the bottom. I hope that these times, these reflections, these, these studies together are just the beginning of our conversations because there is so much more to talk about. I can't wait to be in person again with you someday, hopefully soon, where we can talk more about these things, to encourage each other to notice how we can better anticipate in this world, the world to come. Because that's what it is to believe in Jesus. So a couple of thoughts to reflect on. Do you hope in the bodily resurrection? How would it change your everyday life to integrate this more deeply? Is this image of the life to come more compelling than one of floating on clouds and playing harps? And finally, how will this move you into this life to love the world that God has made? I'm so glad that we have gotten to have this time. And I can't wait for more time to talk and live together loving this world that God has made. The Lord be with you.